Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining this webinar. Uh, as you know, this panel discussion uh, will address and explore Canada's foreign policy and the role uh, of Canada in a shifting global order. This event is, in, is organized by IFRS Canada in partnership with the Canadian Foreign Policy Journal uh, and the Paul, the Paul Grave Macmillan book series on Canada and international affairs, and is also supported by the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, affairs known as NIPSIA. Uh, before we kick off, uh, I'd like to recognize that this event, although virtually, is taking place on the unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin territory. Uh, let me also start by introducing myself. My name is Hattie West. I am the Associate Editor of Media and Public Relations at IFRS Canada. I am also a Master's Candidate uh, at uh, the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs and a TV host and radio host on Rogers TV and Chen Radio 97.9 FM. And I will be your moderator for this panel. Um, we are very pleased to be joined today by an array of participants from across the globe, uh, including government officials, diplomats, politicians, policymakers, trade commissioners, uh, professors, scholars, academics, and many more. Um, this book, as you also know, will be referring to the recently published Palgrave Handbook of Canada and International Affairs. So, uh, before I go ahead and introduce our speakers, I'd like to uh, pass on the virtual mic to Dr. David Carmen to talk about the Paul Grave Macmillan series of books. Dr. Carmen, do you have the mic? Well, uh, thank you very much, Hattie, for that introduction. Um, I want to, on behalf of the school and also as a, a person interested in Canadian foreign policy, uh, extend a warm welcome to our four panelists, Jane, uh, Heather, Bob, and Paul, whom I've worked with in some capacity, way, shape, or form over the years, and it's it's a pleasure always to have an opportunity to work with you again. Unfortunately, we have to do it under these circumstances, but we're, I guess we're all getting used to this kind of Zoom format. Maybe there'll be a day in the near future, maybe in my lifetime, where we'll get a chance to actually physically uh, organize a, a workshop and meet together. But until then, we have to make do with what we've got. This gives us a great opportunity, actually, to bring people in from across Canada, as Hattie pointed out. So that's exactly what we've done. We've got a number of contributors here from this, this sp very special book. It's a handbook of Canada international affairs. It really touches on key subjects that matter to Canada. And it's one of um, nine books currently published by the series uh, for which I've, I've taken responsibility. Uh, as series editor, along with my colleagues, uh, Teddy, Sammy, and Phil Agassé from the school. Uh, we're very fortunate to have some excellent contributions on roll over the last four or five years. We did establish the series uh, with Palgrave with the express purpose of making these, this kind of research available to students, policymakers, decision makers, and academics in a way that is fairly unique these books come to you in a variety of different formats. You can obviously purchase a hard copy, but you can also download the entirety of the volumes uh, in question uh, electronically. You can subscribe to the series as a form of subscription through your institution and access it through a spe very special link that Hattie will bring, bring to your attention in a moment. But you can also get, get access to them through Kindle or other kinds of uh, readers. Um, and so what this means is that you are not tied to buying the book. You can download specific chapters if that particular topic interests you. It gives, gives you, the reader, a great deal of flexibility. To give you a sense of the breadth of coverage we're, we're engaging in it, um, I, I think we've, uh, we're cutting new ground here because we're trying to produce these books in, in a timely manner. The relatively fast turnarounds that we can touch on topics that are absolutely crucial to Canada as it moves into a, a, uh, an era of uncertainty. Uh, we've got a volume on NAFTA 2.0 and the post-Trump era renegotiating that free trade agreement. We've got a, a, a forthcoming volume on governance dilemmas in Canada, North America and beyond, a tribute to Stephen Clarkson. We've got one of several Canada Among Nations volumes that are available to readers. For those of you who have followed uh, Canada Among Nations, you would know it's a flagship publication of the School of International Affairs, where I'm located. Uh, one such volume is International Affairs and Canadian Migration Policy. That was edited by Teddy Sammy and Howard Duncan. Then we've got the one that I took responsibility for this last year, Political Turmoil and Tumultuous World, 
Uh, that's just released and you can access that, as I said, through uh, the Springer link uh, that, it, that Hattie's going to provide for you in a moment. Now that I did with my co-author and co-editor, uh, Richard Nimogene of the School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies at Carleton. Then we have the said book, Palgrave Handbook of Canada International Affairs. We have our bestseller, Canadian Defense Policy and Theory and Practice. And both it and the handbook are massive undertakings. I'm sure Bob uh, and, and Paul love the, the, every moment of putting together a collection of essays, you know, the idea of bringing all these uh, well-disciplined academics uh, together and making sure they met their deadlines. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly easy thing to do. We know how, how easy academics are to, to uh, control and manage. So anyway, they did produce these, these books uh, and it's, it is, uh, we hope, the beginning of something very important where we can get a survey of Canadian and international experts together uh, in, a, in a volume that looks back as well as forward. We have the Canada Among Nations volume, Canada-US Relations, edited by myself and Chris Sands. Then we have uh, the Norman Hilmer and Phil Lagasse, Canada Among Nations, Justin Trudeau and Canadian Foreign Policy. And forthcoming will be a book called The Construction of Canadian Identity from Abroad. And it's from Chris Kirke and Richard Nimogene, who both classify as expats. And what it does is look at how expat Canadians engage in the study of Canadian foreign policy and how they perceive Canada and how Canada uh, perceives them. So this, we're looking forward to seeing that volume being published in the near future. So we're very fortunate to have this uh, group together today. Uh, we, we hope that the discussion will be timely as well as uh, informative. And um, I look forward to the, the, the key points that the, each of the authors will make, as well as the editors, regarding where Canada needs to position itself to be an effective and meaningful actor in international affairs. So thank you very much, Hattie. Thank you very much, Dr. Carmen. I have already, uh, for everyone who's participating, the links uh, for the Springer uh, link and Belgrave uh, have been already posted in the chat, so you may consult them if you want to download these books for free, as Dr. Carmen mentioned. If you are a university student and your university has subscribed to those books. Um, so uh, I just want to also note that uh, this session is being recorded. Uh, for your information, only panelists' faces and names will appear in the recording. Names and faces of participants will not be included. Uh, questions are private and confidential and will be narrated by the moderator, by myself, and answered by the panelists accordingly. So uh, I also want to note that while you're asking questions, there are two tabs in the bottom. One is a Q&A tab and one is a chat uh, tab. Please make sure that you direct your questions and comments in the Q&A uh, tab as opposed to the chat one. Okay, uh, so now I will be moving forward with introducing our uh, speakers for this panel, starting uh, by Dr. Robert Murray. Um, Dr. Robert Murray is a senior fellow at the McDonald Laurie Institute. He previously served as the president and CEO at Grand Prairie Regional College, known as GPRC, managing director of the government practice group at uh, Dentons Canada LLP, and in other executive roles in the think tank, economic development, and educational sectors. His policy experience includes currently serving as the chair of the government of Manitoba's working group for the Winnipeg Metro region, and previously as the inaugural vice chair of advocacy and stakeholder relations for the Council of Post-Secondary Presidents of Alberta, as the chair also of uh, the Alberta Colleges Economic Recovery Task Force, and as a member of the guiding coalition that oversaw the government of Alberta's Alberta 2030, uh, in the title of Building Skills for Jobs System-Wide Review of Alberta's Post-Secondary Education Sector. Our second speaker will be Dr. Heather Exner Pirot. Uh, Dr. Heather Exner Pirot is the managing editor of the Arctic Yearbook, a fellow at the McDonald Laurie Institute, and a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. She is the research advisor to the Indigenous Resource Network and a senior consultant at Morris Interactive. Dr. Exener Piro sits on uh, the boards of the Saskatchewan Indigenous Economic Development Network, the Arctic Institute, 
and the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation. She has previously held positions at the University of Saskatchewan, the International Center for Northern Governance and Development, and the, uh, and the University of the Arctic, and completed her doctoral degree in political science at the University of Calgary in 2011. Her areas of expertise include Northern and Indigenous development, Arctic relations, regional governance, and human security. Our next speaker will be also Dr. Jane Bolden. Dr. Jane Bolden is a professor at the Royal Military College of Canada. From 2004 to 2014, um, she, she, uh, she held that, sorry, from 2004 to 2014, she held a Canada Research Chair in International Relations and Security Studies. She is currently a research fellow at the Queen's University Center for International and Defense Policy. From 2000 to 2004, she was a MacArthur Research Fellow at the Center for International Studies at the University of Oxford. She, uh, her recent books include a co-edited volume with uh, Will Kimlicka titled International Approaches to Governing Ethnic Diversity. Other books with other authors uh, are Responding to Conflict in Africa, the United Nations and Regional Organizations, The Palgrave Macmillan 2013, and earlier books are uh, include the United Nations and Nuclear Orders, Terrorism and the UN before and after September 11th and Peace Enforcement. And last but not least, I will introduce uh, Dr. Paul uh, Jesalowski. Dr. Paul Jesalowski teaches at the University of Windsor and has held positions at Western University and the University of Lethbridge. He was also the inaugural uh, Royal Bank Financial Group Fellow in Political Economy in the Departments of Economics and Political Science at Western University. His research focuses on narratives and foreign policy, foreign policy events, national image and international identity, public diplomacy, state branding, as well as the role of the Prime Minister in Canada, uh, US relations. He is the author of numerous books, book chapters and journal articles in Canadian foreign policy, International Journal, the American Review of Canadian Studies, and Etude Internationale, among others. So without further ado, uh, please join me at welcoming our speakers and be prepared for an insightful discussion about Canada in international affairs. Uh, I would also now like to invite our four panelists to speak for about five minutes each on this topic, following the order they were introduced. While this happens, member of the audience may feel free to ask questions that will be answered later. And please make sure that you direct all your questions and comments in the Q&A box as opposed to the chat box. So we'll get started by uh, Bob. Uh, you like to be called Bob, so we'll call you Bob and you can get started. Thanks very much. If you wanted uh, insightful, you should have started with somebody else, but uh, I'll <laughs> do what I can uh, to get us going here. And so uh, in referencing where you know we're starting the discussion and where actually the handbook project starts is that the international system is evolving and the world order around us is evolving. And as a result of that evolving order, uh, part of the argument that I would put forward is that this evolution requires the development of a proper Canadian foreign policy strategy. We've been operating without a proper Canadian foreign policy strategy for some time, and there have been consequences to operating uh, without a coherent strategy. So this is a really important opportunity uh, for, and a necessity, frankly, for Canada to have to start getting its head around what its role is going to be in the world. And so part of that strategy has to be to finally be able to define and articulate Canada's national interests and the goals of our foreign policy. Starting from the notion that there are a number of elements that presumably we want to pursue in the international system, and we have to be able to clearly identify what those are, not just for the conduct of our foreign policy, but also to better bridge the gap between domestic audiences in Canada and foreign policy, because we know that domestic constituencies are very separated from Canada's foreign policy and have very little interest in foreign policy as a part of Canadian elections, for instance. I'd argue that, you know, perhaps flippantly, that Canada has been the spoiled brats of the international system in recent years. With the unipolar moment and American hegemony in the international system has really meant that we've had it easy and we didn't have to work terribly hard uh, internationally to get the attention of the US being the hegemon. And um, we didn't have to work nearly as hard to pursue our interests given both the proximity to the US and the relationship we had with the US and the number of common interests and common values that we shared with the US. But as recent years have shown where we start seeing divergences in those interests and values, 
Canada is really finding it difficult to start pursuing its own foreign policy goals because it's been operating without, and we've been operating without a strategy for so long. The coming end of unipolarity really puts Canada in the position of having to determine what role we want to play globally, and also what options are available to us to play given capabilities. We often hear a lot of talk about what's available for Canada in the international system and available through Canadian foreign policy, but often there's a severe distinction between what we think we want to be versus what we're actually capable of being and capable of achieving. And so we're having to really insert a, a level of pragmatism into the discussion that I think is going to be very important for us to move forward. And also part of that strategy is a need to think systemically. Uh, we often get tunnel vision when we talk about foreign policy and we go from one issue to the next, or we spend a lot of our time focusing on one actor over others. And right now, and, and more recently, it's been China. And that's come at the expense of taking a look at the whole board when we think about foreign policy and the way the international system operates and the opportunities for Canada as well as the challenges that exist. Part of that new strategy and the idea of a Canadian foreign policy strategy really also has to move beyond buzzwords and fashionable concepts. I think we need a foreign policy that can stand the test of time and also doesn't change with each political whim. We can't keep having new foreign policy ideas introduced every time uh, the, our political leadership federally or even provincially start to get new ideas as to what they want to put forward. And we, we see a lot of our recent foreign policy discussions have been focused on domestic consumption, those buzzwords that we hear in our foreign policy on a regular basis that don't actually reflect a lot of what we're doing in the world are focused on domestic audiences. And that's actually led, in my opinion, to a lack of credibility with the rest of the world. And until we really have a clear foreign policy strategy where we're able to define and articulate our national interests, the world doesn't really know what to expect from Canada. Though right now, I would say that we know the world knows not to expect very much uh, by virtue of our lack of foreign policy strategy in recent years. Part of that strategic uh, decision making and that strategy development process really also needs to review the foundational tenets of Canadian foreign policy. And to take a hard look at what Canada has been in the world and whether or not those tenets really are as useful or will look the same as they do uh, now and moving forward. I think a really good example of that is multilateralism. We hear a lot about Canada as a multilateral nation, but there seems to be a sense that being part of multilateral arrangements or multilateral institutions are goods and ends unto themselves, which is really not the case. I think we need a very strategic and intentional approach to multilateralism and looking at multilateralism as an intentional strategy through which we try to pursue our interests. Uh, and I think when we see the recent failure of Canada on the international level at the UN Security Council to pursue a seat and the lack of success of that campaign, I think comes precisely because we didn't have a very clear vision within ourselves as to why we wanted it. And therefore we couldn't convince the rest of the world as to why there was benefit to put Canada on the UN Security Council. So not having a plan and not being able to understand exactly what it is that we wanna be and wanna project is having real world impacts on our successes. And we also have to learn the lessons of COVID when it comes to multilateralism. We see that yet again, by virtue of the tensions within the WHO and the debates around the WHO's role leading into COVID, that multilateralism and the perception of multilateral institutions globally have again come into question about their utility, but that utility is not necessarily just being part of them. It's being able to use them for the pursuit of our national interests. I think that becomes important. Another element of that strategy I would touch on is the need for unity of federal government, the federal government and provincial governments. Right now, in some instances, we actually have uh, provinces in the, in the country, of course, creating their own foreign policies and trade policies and economic development policies, which is natural. But we're sending mixed messages to global audiences at times where the federal government is trying to take policy positions on certain issues and send certain messages, and we have provinces undermining those messages. So making sure that as part of that discussion around a foreign policy strategy, we're engaging provinces in that discussion as important players on the international stage. And so I'll conclude really by saying that, you know, we'll focus a lot today on some of the challenges that are posed for Canada in the world. And of course, that evolving world order moving from unipolarity to multipolarity or bipolarity uh, is going to present a number of challenges, but there's also a number of really great opportunities for Canada to pursue but we have to be able to know exactly how we're going to pursue them and be able to define very clearly which of those opportunities are the ones that we're going to take the most interest in. So I'll conclude with that.
Perfect. Thank you very much, Bob. We'll move on to our uh, to Heather at the moment. So we got the virtual mic. Heather, go ahead. Great. Thanks so much, and and great introduction, Bob. I thought it was in, insightful myself, and it's my pleasure to be here with with all of you. Uh, I had the Arctic chapter, so I'll just start there. Um, thinking of Canadian foreign policy, I actually think the Arctic has been a bright spot. You know, thinking of the last 20, 25 years, and of course we had leadership in developing the Arctic Council and making sure Indigenous peoples were included in permanent as permanent participants. And but in recent years, I would say that our leadership has been waning, as it has in many other aspects of, of foreign policy. Uh, and I think, you know, I think Canada has focused too much on the Arctic on domestic issues. We do a bit too much naval gazing. And maybe we have a bit too much division and polarization within the country amongst the provinces that it's hard for us, you know, to think of a united front. Um, so, so but some of the things that, you know, I think the, the Arctic is a bright spot or might be a harbinger for some of our foreign policy priorities or considerations in the future are the following. First of all, you know, there is there is still good collaboration in the region. Uh, and I see there's one question on the Arctic, and I'll be happy to answer that in more in more detail. But but it has been a stable, peaceful. There hasn't been a war conflict in the Arctic since I think 1944 uh, when the Finns and the Russians fought. So it has been a, a stable, peaceful area. Uh, it is a place that privileges science, you know, where there's a ton of investment in science and a ton of credence given to science. And, and we talk about evidence-based decision-making. We see that in the Arctic. Uh, you know, to Bob's points about, you know, sub-state actors, you know, we're seeing a lot more of that in the Arctic, not just in Canada, but across the region. And what does that mean for the Arctic? But what does that mean for foreign policy generally, as we see more Western democracies and, and other countries start to have more prominent, I guess, sub-state actors that want to have their say and their interests reflected. We have much more, more than any other place in the world, more of a place for Indigenous peoples, more influence of Indigenous peoples in decision making. Uh, and is that something that can be translated to other places? And then finally, this focus on the environment and climate change. And, and is that, you know, again, is that something else? When I ask myself the question, is the Arctic a model and all these good things and warm fuzzy things can be carried over to other regions and other kinds of policies, or is it an exception? Is it, you know, kind of alone as, as you know, Bob and I have written a paper on Arctic exceptionalism. Uh, so that's kind of what I think, you know, with the Arctic, but it does lead into these bigger questions also that Bob brought up. And in, in the, you know, I have to plug the, the excellent book, we all have our hard copies with us. Uh, we, but, you know, Bob points out that we are in, a, in a, and all the contributors agree, we're in a time of historical change. And of course, we, you know, Trump is a symptom of that, but I don't think he's the cause of that. But here we are in an in a emerging multipolar era. And, and I think Canada did a reasonable job adapting to Trump, but I don't think we've done any kind of job adapting to this multipolarity. And I don't think we've seen a lot of leadership from Canada and or influence able to convey our influence onto other things in our own interests. And that would be a problem, more of a problem coming up. One, you know, one, one manifestation of this that I always ask is, you know, who is the last strong foreign minister that Canada had? And, and we've had so many, I, I doubt anyone could name, you know, the last eight foreign ministers that we had. Uh, and if I were to, you know, I might say Lloyd Axworthy or something like that because the Arctic Council, but the point is most people probably don't know that Mark Garneau is our foreign minister today and why would they? And probably don't, wouldn't expect that after the election he would be. So without that leadership, without that vision, I think Canada's reputation and its interests and its influence have, have been hurt. Um, and then just, you know, and just to wrap this up, what does that mean? What are some of the issues I think we need to look at in the short term? I think energy security, and there's a great article here by Jean-Sebastien Rieu on energy security. That's not going to be something we could ignore, uh, you know, a few years from now. Already natural gas prices are peaking. Already Biden, you know, Biden administration today asking OPEC to increase their production. Canada is the third largest reserve in the world. We can't shut off the Canadian taps without coming at the expense of, you know, being everyone at, at the whim of, of whims of OPEC. So we need to be a lot smarter about how we're dealing with energy security. And on the flip side, how are we going to deal with climate change? You know, uh, and oil and gas is one form of energy. And I think Canada's good at energy. And there's one area where we could help with the transition if we were smarter of it, but it doesn't mean shutting off our own energy production. So those are the kinds of things that I think it might even come into play in election, you know, if people spare any thought to foreign policy. Uh, but these are immediate concerns that Canada needs to get smarter on. Perfect. Thank you very much, Heather. We'll move on now to Jane. Uh, it's all yours now. Thank you, Hattie. Um, and thank you to uh, Bob and Heather. It's actually, we didn't plan this, but I think the pieces of, of what people 
um, are saying will fit together reasonably well with, in some ways, I'd say surprising common themes. I only mean that in the context of such a big handbook with so many issue areas. On that note, I just wanted to take a moment to commend uh, Bob and Paul on the handbook and the other chapter authors who aren't here. Um, and if any of you have had a chance to look at the book already, you'll see there's many chapter authors. So it's a bit daunting to feel like we're representing the group. The wide range of chapters, and I would hasten to guess that people would find it hard to find an issue area not covered there. Um, the wide range of chapters, I think, correctly reflect the scale and complexity of the foreign policy world for Canada now, and for most states. Um, so my topic, my chapter was world order in the United Nations. And so we're sort of moving around different levels and different issue areas here. So I'm going to speak very broadly um, um, in that respect and just throw out a couple of ideas around those broad themes. And hopefully that will contribute to the discussion. And I'm always open to um, whatever questions flow from that. So if you've been tracking foreign policy and international affairs, everybody knows there's a lot of discussion about the changing nature of world order, whether in fact it is changing, um, if it's changing, where is it heading, and so on. I just want to um, pick on a particular area in that discussion that doesn't always get the kind of attention that things like US, China, um, you know, rising and falling powers or the nature of relations, um, those kinds of issues sometimes get. And that's the question of implementation, the question of the distinction between what's envisaged in terms of the world order, what states think the world order should be giving to them or providing to them in terms of stability or other kinds of commitments, and what actually happens in practice. And I think we're at a moment, um, partly in large measure, partly, but nonetheless not solely because of COVID and the pandemic. Um, so one of the ways in which I would argue we are looking at potential system change is in that sense of the world order broadly defined, but we can be more specific about that if we need to, the, the sense in which the world order is not always working in practice in a significant way at key moments for states when they really need it. And that contributes to a kind of undermining or an erosion, if you like, of confidence or even you know, more than that, um, belief. You know, belief being next up from, from just um, from that idea of levels of confidence in the world order, simply giving up the belief that the world order um, as it's portrayed, you know, through all our international commitments and institutions is ever going to really play out in practice, especially for smaller states. And not only does that contribute to undermining the, the concept of world order, but it absolutely contributes to deepening existing fault lines between groups of states, especially um, more well-off, bigger states, uh, smaller states, different regions, all the kinds of cleavages um, we can think about. It's easy to, I've mentioned COVID, that's one area where it's easy to see how that disjuncture is, has been in play, right? The World Health Organization struggled um, as an institution, continues, I would say, to struggle as an institution to meet the challenge of the pandemic. But even beyond that, the ways in which bigger, more capable states have reacted in that context um, to the challenge of the pandemic contributes to questioning whether or not um, the world order is what it's said to be or is working um, or is working only for certain states at certain times. That links to that question of big powers and their commitment to the world order. Heather mentioned the Trump administration. Um, we don't have the Trump administration anymore, but we certainly have the after effects, um, one of which was questioning the extent to which big powers um, are um, to control. I pick on the United States. It's not the only one that raises that question, but um, as Canadians, it's the one we probably track the most closely. Um, so, specific to Canada, right? One of the um, one of the older 
would say, uh, um, ideas around Canadian foreign policy um, is that question or that concept of functionalism, right? That idea that there should be a link between a state's willingness to step up, to play, to take responsibility at the international level and their influence. And Canada used that concept to great effect um, um, for decades uh, through the Cold War. Um, but I would argue it doesn't really hold anymore. Um, and the, in a sense that we haven't been taking on responsibilities in the way we used to. And there's questions going to Bob's point about whether we even have um, an overarching sense of a plan of what areas we might take responsibility in and what ways or take a leadership role in. One area where I'd say there is perhaps a linkage there that's still in play is NATO. And uh, Joel Skolsky has a, a, a really good chapter uh, in the handbook that, that makes that point. You know, just because of an election is on people's minds today, that concept that Trudeau or that phrase, the famous or infamous phrase Trudeau used, we're back um, last time around um, or first time around is um, probably only applicable to NATO. Right? And Canada has not articulated a set of priorities in a practical foreign policy review sense, but arguably demonstrates a sense of priorities on the ground and in that sense, um, NATO won out, won out over the UN. Just to close, it's no, uh, there's no lack of opportunity for Canada to take responsibility and play a leadership role. Some of these areas, Heather mentioned a number of them in respect to the Arctic. Um, we can talk about climate, nuclear arms control, where Canada used to be um, a leader as well. We could come back to that health security, health uh, institutions more broadly, also an area where we could play a role. There's a potentially long list, but it's not clear that Canada wants to um, take on those leadership roles, either in the general sense of making a commitment to world order and making sure world order runs in the way um, we anticipate it should, or with respect to specific issue areas. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Jane. And now we'll move on to Paul. Go ahead. You can go ahead, Paul. I had to figure out how to unmute it. I rely on my daughters to do most of the technical stuff around here. So um, I just want to first uh, thank Hattie and David for, for putting this together and for Bob and his partnership in putting the book together. It was a uh, it was an effort, but it it was an, an enjoyable effort at the end of the day. And I think the results um uh, speak for for the efforts that the authors put in and that Bob and I put in and um, hopefully people will will enjoy reading it and be and be informed by it. Um, I guess my comments kind of pick up on on some of the themes uh, that have already been addressed, uh, particularly some of the ones that Jane and Heather uh, picked up and, and obviously uh, Bob as well. Um, I, I'm going to take a step back from from Bob a bit. He talked about Canada you know, having it relatively easy in the unipolar period, I would I would say we've had it easy all along, uh, right from 1867 right through to today. Uh, we've we've grown up in, in in an Anglo order, first one led by Britain and then one led by the United States. It's an order that uh, speaks English, which is a huge uh, asset, you know, right? Um, and it's one that was based upon more Anglo principles, and so Canada has always felt comfortable. In, in the global order. Um, and because of that, we've been allowed certain privileges and certain opportunities that maybe some other states haven't been allowed. We've always played you know, a, a supporting role uh, to, to the leader, right? And so we've always found the, the order very comprehensible and we've always found the order very, very navigable um, and with, with, with few uh, difficulties. And I think uh, that situation is about to change um, because I think the main challenger to the to the current order is obviously China. There's others, Russia and, and others that play, you know, a, a, a supporting role. But the main challenger right now is China. And so what impact are they going to have on the, the 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 environment in which Canadian foreign policy is is going to be made? Right. Um, and I think there are two uh, two uh, forces um, that are happening right now, two shifts. One is the emergence of China, 
and we see China emerging not just in a material sense. If you looked at any, you know, any metric that you want to look at in terms of uh, the command of the commons that Posen put out there, any any military metric, China is approaching the United States or has uh, surpassed it in certain ways. Um, if you want to look at economic metrics, similarly, if you want to go purchasing power parity, uh, China has surpassed surpassed the U.S. economy. So if we look in terms of of you know the material sense of order, uh, China is number two and and will be number one in the in the not too distant future. But where China is playing a, a I think in a, a more important role more recently is on the normative side, um, and that is China is wanting to be a participant in the international order much more than in the past. It's coming out of its shell, as as you could say, um, and it, it's supporting. Uh, a, a model of statehood or development, if you want to use that term, that is much more conducive to Chinese interests. So it is supporting more illiberal regimes uh, throughout uh, Central Asia and other places, uh, what some have called authoritarian regionalism. It supports uh, a system of, of political meritocracy where uh, people are uh, moved through the system more based upon adherence to party orthodoxy and performance rather than on some idea of democratic norms or support of, of the populace. Um, and, and so that, that provides a, a whole range of actors uh, support and impetus. Um, and it's something that, again, very different than, than Canada and our democratic tradition. Um, the whole idea of rule by law, not rule of law, which we see playing out in the two Michaels cases and other cases where the law changes uh, with respect to what the government wants it to be, right? And, and the law is seen as being more of a tool now as a tool of power rather than a constraint on power as it is in, in Western systems. So I think we have a very different view of uh, international order and, and the principles that are going to, uh, you know, um, uh, that are going to make up that order than what is at present. And it's an order that Canada is not gonna feel overly comfortable in. Um, the second thing, the second shift, in, and some have mentioned it already, is US distraction, right? Um, at the international level, the US is not playing a leadership role in terms of military. I thought it was interesting, uh, uh, Graham Allison and Henry Kissinger both stated that, you know, if you look at the post-war period, the Americans law have lost four of the five conflicts which they've been involved in. The only one that they could even say is even close to being a victory would be the first Iraq war. And even that, the, the victory was only getting Kuwait uh, um, uh, freed from Iraqi forces, Saddam Hussein stayed in power. But if you look at the others, particularly Iraq to and Afghanistan, these, these have not proved um, very um, successful for the US, right? By any stretch of the imagination. Um, and you look in terms of, of the economics, uh, the, the 2008 financial crisis is seen as being a watershed movement towards a, a moving away from a unipolar system. Um, and this was because the US was the source of the problem, not uh, aiding in the problem. And this, this is seen as being you know, um, uh, very, very problematic as well as China is increase in, in um, its economic strength. Um, also, as we all know, uh, the U.S. is dividing within itself. There's increasing polarization and dysfunction, right? Um, just look at uh, the U.S. in the post-COVID world, the debates over vaccination, over masking, and all these other things, and the splits uh, between the Trumpists and, and others within the states, the blue states, the red states. The U.S. is really going through a, a crisis of trying to find who, define who they are. And as a result of this, they're, they're going through a crisis of defining what they wanna do in the world. And you have a split in, in both parties. The Republicans are split again with the pro-Trumpists and, and the old school Republicans. The Democrats are, are split between the Green New Dealers and the old school Democrats like Joe Biden. And so you have these debates within the US that have led to more in, internal focus in its politics than external focus. Um, and this didn't start with Trump. Uh, the U.S. has always had a, a you know, a, a strain in its foreign policy that has been internally focused. Uh, 
Mead talks about this in terms of Jacksonian and Jeffersonian strains. Brand talked about exemplar strands in foreign policy. Uh, Washington's farewell address. These, these things uh, have been there for a long time. Tr Trump has accentuated them, but he, he's not the source of it. it. It's much more longer lasting. And this is going to be problematic. Right. So with these two uh, movements, the, the Chinese becoming more aggressive and the U.S. being more inward focused, uh, puts Canada in a bit of a bind because where where do we sit now? What, what, what policies are we going to pursue? And as they've all as everyone's mentioned, we don't have any direction and we haven't had any direction. The last foreign policy review was in 2005. Right. The world's very different now. And as we've all talked about, the election that is coming up in the fall. I think one of the things that that needs to be done is at least we have discussions like this where we talk about foreign policy and we, we get a government that articulates a foreign policy. I think it's about time that we had a review, a, a full scale review that talked about that talks about and deals with many of the things that Bob mentioned. You know, what are the priorities in Canadian foreign policy? It was interesting when Bob was talking about it. It reminded me of a. Uh, Kim Nossel, who used to talk about the GST of policy, the goals, strategies, and tactics of policy, right? We need to have those discussions about what each of those mean and, and can, for Canada in the new context. All right, now I'll just end there and, and hopefully we'll get some interesting questions and we can get into some of this in more detail. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you, Paul, and thank you uh, to all of you to, uh, for such uh, incredible uh, pieces of information to get started. Uh, now I'd like us to jump into the discussion immediately. Um, our first uh, question is by one, of the, by one of the attendees and they would like the panelists to, to, to address basically or talk about the impact of Canada's failed bet for a seat uh, at the UN Security Council and how that influences Canada's foreign uh, policy within the multilateral system. Um, I'll open up the floor for a conversation or for discussion. Any of you who wants to get started, go ahead. I, I can jump in on that and others can follow if they like. So perhaps provocatively, I would argue that the impact has been more domestic than international. Um, and I say that because in some ways, I would argue that at the international level, the outcome was what most people expected. And having said that, I would like to just make a uh, shout out, as it were, to the UN, uh, the mission staff and the others involved in the campaign, because they actually did a remarkable job of getting us as close as we did get in the end. Um, but it was perhaps not... a strategic move to pick a year in which you had two strong states like Ireland um, and Norway to compete with. Um, some of the themes we've been talking about play out here in the sense, that's what I mean when I say at the international level, nobody was particularly surprised um, because the other states in question have been playing more of a leadership role, taken on more responsibility, um, had a longer campaign, um, played all those parts of the puzzle um, um, earlier and more effectively than, than Canada did, and that is how people expected it to play out. I don't think there are huge, I mean, everybody notes it, um, but I don't think there are huge implications in our ability to um, engage in um, international affairs as a result of it. It's too bad. I we try again. I hope we're just a little more, um, again, repeat it, but anyway, strategic about when we do it and how we do it. I'm going to jump in to follow if I can. I, I agree that domestically there was a, an interesting reaction at the end, and I, I agree with Jane that it didn't come as a terrible surprise internationally, but the reason it didn't come as a terrible surprise internationally is that we really didn't take it all that seriously for quite some time. And Full credit to uh, Global Affairs Canada staff and the UN mission staff who actually put together a campaign after the profoundly unserious approach of the federal government on the political side that took a little bit too long to actually realize that this was not something you'd walk through. Uh, and I give our, our Global Affairs staff and UN mission staff a lot of credit in trying to put a campaign together without a platform and without a really uh, central campaign focus. Um, and as we're going to find out in the fall, uh, those people that run without a very clear platform and vision for what you're going to bring don't really have much of a uh, chance of winning. 
Um, that being said, I also think we learned from it. I think from that point, the impact of that internationally and domestically led to some changes in the way that the government approached the UN. And I think that the one tenet of our foreign policy that is operating quite well right now happens to be uh, Bob Ray as our UN ambassador. I think he's been doing a tremendous job given what he inherited and uh, really the state of affairs of Canada at the UN. So I give the federal government credit for having learned from that embarrassment, uh, both internationally and domestically, and it shows that we are willing to learn, but my hope is that we don't have to go through on a piecemeal effort and, and keep losing international credibility in order for us to learn those hard lessons. Paul and Heather, would any of you want to jump in? Oh, oh Paul's not gonna jump in. Well, you only did it first, so it's all yours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll say two things. First of all, a lot of Canadians and I, this is this whole thing was an, a, an exemplar of what the Laurentian elite care about that didn't matter to you know a lot of I guess working class Canadians and that we spent and and, and a feeling that maybe the government spent more time on it uh, and what are you know are, are there practical implications or not I think there are those symbolic implications and I think there's a lot of criticism criticism of Harper he didn't know didn't care was a bit of a pariah uh, you know on world affairs. And for a lot of people, there's merry embarrassment about that, you know, and then for Justin to come back and say Canada's back and then lose the seat, you know, just shows it, it wasn't, it wasn't just the Harper model. It was the Canadian model, you know, that had, that had some failings. And so I do think it this is symbolic that Canada can't just come in. Uh, you know, we, we expended the capital that we earned in the fifties and the sixties and the seventies. And we can't carry that anymore and count on that to get us you know, in, our, in our privileged positions anymore. So we do need to be better uh, going forward if we think that these things are important and that they do reflect our interests. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, um, I agree with what everybody else said. And I think uh, the, the UN security seat seemed more like um, the Trudeau government saw it more as a, an award for the change from the Harper government. Right. And the whole we're back, the rhetoric, uh, the rhetoric, but not really any of the action, because we haven't really seen you know, Bob Ray at the UN is doing a good job. But we, we, we haven't put our money where our mouth is, really, in terms of UN security, uh, in terms of, you know, UN forces and that. Uh, Walter Van Dorn had that column just a couple of days ago in The Globe about that. Um, we've talked a good game, but we still haven't put our resources there. Um, and so it, it's not surprised. Um, and, and like I said, I, it seemed it was more of a branding effort by the, the leadership, the political leadership, than it, 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 in their minds, than anything else. That was something that, because we had changed from the Harper government uh, to, to, the, you know, to the Trudeau government, that it would be easier to get. Perfect. Thank you. Would any of you would like to add any comments regarding this? Because I, I'd like us today to try to address as many uh, subjects as possible, because talking about Canada and international affairs and foreign policy is a huge, uh, a huge topic to go through and could be divided to multiple subtopics. Uh, so if any of you would have a comment, go ahead, or I can just move on to the next topic. Perfect. Let's move on. Uh, even when you're muted, I can understand what you're talking about. But uh, so I know that a lot of you in your introductory comments uh, mentioned uh, China and Canadian Chinese relations, Canada China relations. Uh, we do have a question, but I do know that currently over over the past probably a few years, Canada and China have been going through a lot of uh, issues, including the two Michaels, uh, the Huawei situation, the um, the human rights issues and other stuff. Uh, to touch on also this, and one of the questions that can also be extended to a bigger topic, given the sensitive Canada-China situation and recent parliamentary decision to recognize the Uyghur issue as a genocide, can we expect Canada to take concrete action? I, I can start. Um, I mean, first of all, concrete action on what? On the genocide, no. Um, absolutely not. I think in terms of the overall approach to China, um, I would be content with us having a view of an approach to China that really look like rank amateurs at times in foreign policy. We've had a decade's worth of seeing China's behavior with other states, with other democratic states, and with other Western democratic states, 
And yet for years, Canada has clung to this idea that somehow we are going to be different and we're going to be exempt from some of what we've seen in China's engagement with other states. And it seems to be our federal government is focused on learning the hard way as often as possible and as much as possible before it figures out that Canada is not going to get a different outcome dealing with China than everybody else gets when dealing with China, and particularly when there's areas of disagreement. And at, for a while, it was holding out hope for a free trade agreement with China, which has rightfully gone uh, the way of the dodo, given recent tensions. And so when we're looking at how to engage with China, there's absolutely no doubt that we have to have a pragmatic plan to engage with China as international order evolves. And assuming that we know that China is going to be one of the poles in either a bipolar system or a multipolar system, whichever comes out at the end of the day. But recently, in recent years, what we have seen is a, in my opinion, naive approach of the Canadian government as to how to be engaging with China. Simultaneously, I would go back to that point I made in my introductory remarks about the sub-federal piece, and somebody asked a question about an example of where the, the provinces and the feds are not necessarily aligned at times. And we saw this play out over China in two ways. So for instance, Alberta's premier, uh, Jason Kenney, stood up and took a few very solid shots at China when the federal government was still trying its uh, diplomatic approach with China and, and playing nice. Jason Kenney's remarks undermined the national government, the federal government's approach. But simultaneously, as the federal government has hardened towards China, you still have provinces and even other sub-provincial entities like municipalities and regions heading over to China or paying consultants to go to China for what they still perceive as economic development opportunities, which really have dried up. So we, that inconsistency with China, I think, is also predicated still on almost a romantic view of what dealing with China is going to be and how China is going to react to Canada, some based on hubris, but also based on unreasonable expectations. So some of those are some of the pieces I would, I would use to start the conversation. Okay. Heather, I know you unmuted previously. You want to go well, ahead? I keep waiting for Paul to unmute because he's got 100 times more expertise on China than I, but, and, I, and I'll address more about China and the Arctic. I see there's a great question on that. So in the context of the Arctic, just in this context to, to first build on Bob's earlier point that, you know, we, we, have, we have had it easy and we don't know how to do hard things and China is a hard thing and we haven't figured out how to deal with China. Uh, so, and, and, and we need to start balancing. You know, we need to start finding allies. We need to start applying more pressure. And I know it's very Canadian to sit here and hand ring about how Canada is a rank amateur. And I do agree with that, Bob. But we, but also China is going to pay some prices for for its behavior soon too. You know, um, so so it's not. It, it, so there's some failures on all sides. And hopefully, and for the sake of the global order, we all figure out and be more pragmatic. Uh, in the future. And and Bob, just one last thing. You mentioned an interesting thing. I think from a conservative perspective, yes, there's appetite for a harder line, more principled line, that kind of thing. At the same time, a lot of the economic impacts of being tough on China will be fallen by Western Canada because we export raw materials to China and there'll be a lot of provincial pressure and a lot of voter pressure to, you know, don't stop canola exports and don't stop oil exports and don't stop lumber exports. Uh, that'll be very damaging. So a very fine line for all the parties to play there. Uh, just to add, um, you can add students into that equation too, Heather. They send thousands of students to Ontario uh, and they pay, you know, full price, and that that puts, uh, I think, did some quick calculations last year about thirteen million dollars, uh, the number of students they send to Ontario, just just uh, high school students. I'm not talking post secondary. I'm just talking high school students. Um, and uh, as of last year, um, the Ontario government has decided to take half of that. Uh, and only let the school boards, it used to be the school boards collected it all. Now the provincial government takes half and they give the school boards half. So um, you can expect even more students coming into Ontario uh, once once they're allowed. Um, yeah, it, the China is a hard case and it, it's, it's something that is a source of revenue for a lot of Canadians, as you mentioned. And, and so it's also a very, it's a domestic issue because as we all know, Harper tried to be hard on them as, as O'Toole is now. And we, it, that failed because there, there are more mainland Chinese in Canada than there are Hong Kong Chinese, uh, 10 times more. And their votes count. They count in, in vote rich areas like the GTA 
and in, in the lower mainland, right? And so if you don't want to form government, then you take a hard position against China and you won't get their votes. It's, it's as simple as that in an electoral calculation. Um, one of the areas that is going to be very interesting in the future is the Arctic, because as you know, China has declared itself a near Arctic state. And it's teaming up with Russia now to develop uh, the, the, the northern resources, which is going to put a lot of pressure on Canada uh, and what we do up there and, and where the boundaries are, as you know, Russia has staked claim to much wider swaths of territory up there for the resources. Um, and, and so, th and I think that is one of the areas where in the future, it's going to take uh, bold Canadian action. Uh, we are going to have to defend that territory um against incursions from uh, the russians and the chinese um they've already sent ships through the northwest passage and will continue to do so um the idea is they wanted to make a you know a, a deep water port in northern manitoba uh to get the the resources out much quicker um will will the canadian government allow them to do that for the economic you know gain that is given to to, to the area um, th these are questions that, that, that I said, government, any future government is going to have to deal with. And I think we need to start dealing with it now, rather than putting them off in the future. This is why, as Bob mentioned, as we all mentioned, the review is necessary. We need to figure out what it is we want to do. What, and where, what role do we want to play in the world? And how much are we willing to pay for it? Um, and the, these questions are, are, are central when we, when we talk about China. Thank you, Jane. Would you like that? Anything? No, I'm good. I think it's been covered in, in the interest of other issues. I'll, I'll hold Perfect. back. Thank you. While we're talking still about, uh, you know, we touched on the Arctic a little bit. We're transitioning, I feel, towards the Arctic to have a conversation, but also we're touching on, on, on Russia and China, as Paul also talked about. Uh, I want to basically uh, pose one of the questions posed by the audience. Is there a real threat of conflict in the Arctic between Canada and Russia slash China? And does the Arctic, do you think, does the Arctic Council act as an effective broker or peacemaker in the region? I mean, I live and breathe this question <laughs> every day. So I so I jump at the chance. And, and Paul, I, I'm probably the biggest dove when it comes to Arctic conflict issues. Um, my supervisor was Robbie Hubert, which some of you guys know, we called him Dr. Doom. And we always, you know, <laughs> so I've always taken the opposite, but I think not of naivete, but out of, you know, look at, look at the facts. So I'll have a slightly different perspective. Do I think there's going to be conflict? No, because I think when you, when you understand the Arctic region and how, how difficult of a theater is, and the fact that you can't just go and start drilling, like every, Every project in the Arctic is probably a $10 billion mega project. And you can't do that under the slide. And you can't even get investment to do that if your boundaries aren't clear. So no one's going to do it if things are uncertain. And, and, and then the thing about Russia is it's got half the Arctic. And it's got the oil and the gas. And it's got all the resources. And it's beside China. It doesn't need Canada's Arctic. In fact, the problem for everyone in the Arctic is we all have too much Arctic. Greenland's too much Arctic. Alaska has too much Arctic, Canada has too much Arctic, Russia has too much Arctic that we we don't we can't steward it, we can't control it. So to think that we need to go to other people's territories to steal their resources in the Arctic, I think is not it's not practical. That's not how resource development works. So that's my opinion there. It, even even Doctor Doom, you know the Doctor Dooms of the world, probably they you know have evolved to say it's unlikely that you'll have conflict over the Arctic, that you're not going to have some kind of territorial invasion. And again, part of the problem is there's no infrastructure to invade or to use, you know, to, to, to practically do such a thing. But what you might have, and I'll, and I'll concede this, is that the Arctic may be used as a theater in a, in a global kind of bipolar situation, that it just happens to be a region where the United States and Russia and China are present. And so there could be some conflict there, but not due to the Arctic, but as a spillover from, you know, other issues. Where I actually see tension, and China, like almost no expertise, like I can't emphasize enough how difficult it is to operate militarily in the Arctic. And China has almost no expertise and ability to do so. Uh, and it's, you know, it would be decades off from doing such a thing. So, uh, so it's not really an option for them. 
The melting sea ice makes a lot of things harder. Melting permafrost makes things harder. It doesn't make it easier to go into the Arctic. And that's something that I don't think people always appreciate. The biggest opportunity for conflict, and this goes back to Trump, I think is the Northwest Passage. There was a real threat that they were going to do a freedom of navigation operation in the Northwest Passage last year. And I don't know how Canada could have responded to that because we can't allow it. We cannot allow a phone op exercise in the Northwest Passage, but we also have no ability to stop it. Uh, and I think, and, and under Trump, they, you know, they were seriously considering that maybe they would do such a thing because they had a bit of a, pardon my French, a bit of an FU attitude to everyone else. You know, their Americans are going to do what they want. Uh, I don't think we have that problem with Biden, but it's not a problem that's going to go away. Um, so that for me is the greatest source of tension, not Russia. And for the Arctic Council, just to finish off that question, yes, it has definitely acted as a norm builder, as a confidence builder. That's the biggest thing I think is it's built confidence so that at least Russian and American, there is close contacts between senior ambassadors in Russia and Canada and elsewhere where they could pick up the phone and you know just avoid that miscommunication, uh, which could uh, lead to an accidental conflict, which I think is the only practical conflict that you might have. Perfect, thank you. Anybody would like to add anything on this? Yeah, I'll, uh, this is why it's so interesting for Heather and I to have written together on this because we, we disagree on some things, we agree on other things. So what I would say is that, first of all, conflict is not only going to be defined by hard power. Um, so can the Arctic still be a source of conflict politically, economically? Yes, I believe it possibly can. Everything that Heather said about tangible capabilities usage in the Arctic is correct. Uh, I would also just note that this idea that Canada has to defend it. We're not even close to capable to defending ourselves if somebody was to ever encroach on our physical territory in the Arctic. It's, it's a completely impractical idea. And there seems to be a preoccupation with this. I think it was born during the Harper era where you had those uh, the photo ops of Harper and his khakis uh, with the Rangers up in the Arctic and riding a, a four wheeler. But I think it's important to recognize even the Canadian context, that is not actually the most important context. And that the militaristic conversation is distracted from the human development and economic development aspects of the Arctic that we actually do have to be focusing on as a, as a country in order to assert sovereignty if it is going to be a fundamental debate about sovereignty and that's often overlooked. Um, in specific response to some of the, the state calculations, I, I agree with Heather insofar as that's where we're at right now, but the history of international affairs is that we don't always assume that states properly understand or evaluate other states' intentions or interests. And misperception in the past is often what has led to conflict, whatever form that conflict has taken. The Arctic, as more states become interested, more trying to assert themselves, despite some having either no or weak territorial claims, uh, misperception is possible and therefore conflict is possible. Is it likely to be, you know, Cold War or World War II-esque hard power conflict? No, probably not by virtue of those logistics. But I think that that idea of threat perception and the ripeness for misperception that we see on a regular basis as, as to how states perceive the intentions and actions of others is very much at the heart of why there could be, I'm not saying there will be, but there could be, as a good uh, realist, uh, could be <laughs> misperception among states that could potentially lead to conflict. So that's all I would add to what Heather had to say. Perfect. I'd like us to wrap up this discussion on the Arctic, but so I'll, I'll end it with a perfect question actually to end it from one of the audience members. Could each of you in one sentence talk about what are Canada's security priorities in the Arctic? In one sentence, please. We'll start with Heather, since you are the most passionate. <laughs> and not only what I think, but what the Canadian government is actually doing is it's emergency response. That's where almost, you know, from the military perspective is focused on is there is there is going to be more activity, maybe not as much as people think. And so we do need to have better ability, you know, capability to respond uh, to potential mishaps. Perfect. Can I move on to Jane? Because you haven't spoken in a while. Climate. Climate. Perfect. One word, one sentence. Uh, let's move on to Paul and then Bob. In the Arctic, uh, the climate and uh, ensuring our, our our sovereignty perfect and then uh uh bob uh, human economic and ecological development 
Perfect. And that wraps it up for uh, for the Arctic. There are several issues to talk about through the questions and questions that IFR has also prepared. I actually want to jump into, um, maybe we're jumping back a little bit, but to a question that uh, Dr. Sami has asked uh, while we were talking about multilateralism. Dr. Sami, as we know, is the Dean and Director of NIPSIA and also one of the uh, series editors for the Paul Grave Macmillan books. So he's asking, we've been uh, hearing about the need for a strategy for a while, including a foreign policy review, which the speakers have also mentioned. Can you unpack what such strategy would look like is it a stronger embrace of multilateralism, not just in terms of what we say, but instead backed by resources? Who would like to start? Go ahead, Jane. I, I can start since um, nobody else is leaping on that one. Um, and there's been a couple of questions phrased differently on the foreign policy review question. So I'm, I'm gonna just try and pick up a couple of points there. What would that strategy look like? I mean, in some ways, frustratingly, it would look a lot like past ones. Like we in this group, and I mean that including many of the participants could probably write the first chapter. Um, it would, you know, mirror past reviews in setting that overarching stage for what Canada, you know, what Canada's interests, values, norms are you know, the rules-based global international order and so on. A lot of those themes are consistent across decades of Canadian foreign policy reviews. And I wouldn't expect that to change dramatically. Might change in the order of things, there might be an addition, but, you know, overall, the parameters are going to be pretty similar to what they've always been. The question is what happens next, right? In that, you know, that review process. What are the, what are the specifics in that context? Um, I would say, um, not sure who had the question this way, but yes, for me, whatever it is, back it up with resources, back it up with commitment. That has been one of our, um, one of the ways in which we faltered, particularly in the post-Cold War world, is that tendency to promise too much and not um, deliver. Not on everything, but on a number of things. Um, and that does get noticed. I would say, and this goes to my point um, about the Arctic, what's interesting is that so far in this conversation, we haven't paid a lot of attention to the question of climate. And that's interesting given the IPCC um, report that's come out in the past few days and what we might be expecting um, in the uh, future. I think there's two more um, phases of that report to, to play out. This goes to one of the questions or comments that I saw in, in the chat where what, um, um, how do you articulate and get a commitment from the Canadian public on um, applying resources to foreign policy, which is a traditional problem in Canada, right? One of the things we've kind of referenced in passing is that foreign policy tends not to be an election issue. And I think that reflects a broader sense of, um, I think that's consistent over time and reflects a broader sense of the domestic priorities. Um, but I would argue that the climate, climate change, climate, whatever phrase we want to use is perhaps for the first time in a while, a issue that crosses that domestic foreign border um, definitively. You know, we can start to make the case to different aspects of the Canadian population. And I just mean that in it's affecting different sectors of Canadian population in different ways. Um, but that linkage between what's happening globally and the need for a foreign policy international response directly relates to what people are experiencing in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and so I would expect in any kind of foreign policy review that that kind of linkage would drive the prioritization we would see or should drive the prioritization would, we would see, but also is a way for any government to make that domestic foreign linkage in a way that wasn't possible previously. Just a quick overview. Perfect. Thank you, Jane. Uh, anyone else would like to jump in? Sure. Um, just to pick up on what, what some of what Jane said, I, I think she's right that, that climate is, has become uh, one of the, the, the main 
as I mentioned before, you know, Nossel's GST. Uh, it used to be economic uh, development of the Canadian economy, uh, maintaining Canadian security. These were the basic goals, and I think climate is part of that now, and it hasn't been in previous reviews. I think that it is would one of the first order uh, goals of, of any state, and particularly Canada, a state with natural resources and, and as large as we are, uh, uh, you know, climate change would have to be of first order priority. Um, the idea of multilateralism, again, not to, not to just repeat everything Jane said, but the idea of, you know, putting our, our, our money, our resources into our commitments, this idea of what you, uh, pragmatic multilateralism, maybe, um, to, to put another adjective in front of it, um, uh, and, and to make sure that, you know, what we say we're willing to do. Um, and, and engage the various actors in Canada about what, what are the, their priorities beyond that, right? And so I think there are, are a set of base base strategies or base, I mean, goals that, that all governments have, but it, the, the question is, how do we then, you know, achieve those? What are the various strategies and tactics we use? And that's where the parties differ, uh, or are supposed to differ. And I don't think we see, and that's what we need, I think, uh, more debate on. And and to to um, and I think that that's the the important thing. Um, and, and foreign policy, I, I m many people said it's it's not part of elections, and I would kind of disagree. It's not an issue, a general issue in an elections. Even even free trade in '88 wasn't a a thing that brought people out in, to vote. Um, but it is an issue for for key segments of the population in that. It's how Canada deals with their home country. So for Chinese Canadians, as we talked about earlier, in the GTA and in the lower mainland, Canada's China policy is an important part of their vote. And I would suggest similarly with the South Asian community in those same areas, in those key battleground ridings, Canada-India policy is important to them. Um, and, and in elections, I think it, 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 this is where you know foreign policy comes into play and we see the various uh, political parties, uh, you know, sending different messages to different communities in order to, to get, get votes. Um, you know, this micro targeting that, 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 that goes on in our elections nowadays. Any? Perfect, anyone else? Bob? Just to add, I guess, you know, I, I think first of all, the articulation of national interests, as I had said, is one of the most important pieces of a strategy that we're gonna have to develop. And we have to stop First of all, trying to be all things to all people, and we have to stop over-promising and under-delivering because that is costing us credibility on the international stage. And with a new uh, international systemic structure, that has more consequences than it would have in the past. Part of the concern I think that we have, or that I have, is that even during an era of American hegemony, we still struggled to advance things that we would typically associate with the liberal international agenda because ultimately states are still going to be uh, mostly self-interested and they are still not going to advance concepts and ideas past a certain point that they're not going to be comfortable with. So how are we going to be able to advance those issues as the world becomes less liberal, small l liberal, less liberal, and entering a new structure where to Paul's point, uh, non-Western great powers start to rise and seriously affect our uh, willingness and ability to actually get those things done. The only other point that I want to make is, is we've heard multilateralism mentioned a few times and you know, multilateralism is not a blanket concept where all things work well. And part of the consideration of a strategy is where do we want to actually put our resources? Is it into formal institutions or is it in a normative multilateralism that doesn't necessarily require institutional frameworks? And if it are, they are institutional frameworks, where do we see the alignment between the institutions that are going to allow us to pursue our interests versus those institutions that we may actually scale back from or pull back from because they are working on agendas that are no longer entirely consistent with the norms and the national interests that we've articulated. So we assume, and rightfully so, that multilateralism would remain the cornerstone of a Canadian foreign policy as well it should, but how we use multilateralism has to become more strategic, more deliberate, and more intentional because this idea that we just sign up to everything and that being part of multilateral institutions is a good unto itself, I think is problematic. I don't think that serves us well. And it's also not reflective of why states use multilateral institutions in the first place. 
So I think if there are a set of agenda items that we choose that we want to pursue as part of a new strategy, multilateral institutions inherently are going to be very important for us to actually pursue those interests, but which institutions at which uh, resource level will be very important decisions for us to help navigate that world order. Okay, perfect. Anyone else? Heather, you said you wanted to skip on it, but you'd like to talk about uh, climate and economy, I believe. Um, yes, I do have a question about climate particularly, and I think it might be a more of a generic question, but um, I wanted to ask about how, do, how does each of you evaluate or assess Canada's global efforts in combating climate change? Heather? Well, I'll start. Yeah, I wanted to talk about, and I see there's an, uh, an energy question too, and I think it's two sides of the same coin. Um, can't, so, so I'm more interested in, so I'm, I'm not not interested in climate, but I'm very, the problem with climate is it's about energy security. We will solve climate change when we can solve sources, better sources of energy. And so it's the same, you know, it's the same problem. And Canada right now is an energy superpower. And a lot of that is oil sands. And that obviously emits, you know, it's got high, high GHGs and that kind of thing. But on, first of all, in the first instance, we're all still dependent on oil and gas. And we, and it'd be very bad for Canada and especially for others in Asia and Africa and elsewhere to be dependent on OPEC as the only source of, of, of oil and gas as far as, you know, and it's going to be decades until, you know, we transition where it isn't. Right now, I think it's 85%. Coal, oil and gas provide 80% of the world's energy needs. So while renewables are taking up some of the slack of the increase, we're not really decreasing our oil and gas. So Canada, and this is, you know, this goes to one of the chapters in the book. We are, you know, one of the only one that's an energy superpower that hasn't leveraged this position somehow in our foreign policy. You know, that we haven't used the fact that we have these tremendous resources as a way to influence or, or direct you know, other, other actors, you know, behaviors in some way. And, and I think we, we won't have, we will be pushed to probably within five years, we see private North American producers not getting investment, not investing in production. They're paying off debts um, and the production is not increasing. It's kind of at this COVID lows and it's not gonna go a lot higher. Meanwhile, demand is growing. And as I said before, the Biden administration is calling on OPEC to increase its production so that we don't have $150 barrel oil, which will cause you know, food, food to spike and, and every material to spike. So on the one hand, we need to be smarter with how we do use our oil. And we can't just say Canada's out of this game. I don't, think, I don't think at some point the world will not accept that because it won't be able to accept Saudi or Russian or, or Iranian demands. Now, on the flip side, how do we, you know, how do we solve climate change? What role can Canada play? Well, we have a small part of the emissions, not proportionately, but as a whole, absolutely a small part of the proportion. But we are very smart in terms of figuring out ways to deliver energy. And so we are leading on carbon capture and we are leading on you know, changing um, you know, petroleum into hydrogen, which burns clean. So there's no way for me out of this climate change crisis without, and we have uranium, you know, we're, an, we're a nuclear superpower. We're a superpower in all of these ways. So we need to start just using our innovation. The metals that we have will be the ones that create the batteries. We cannot sit out of this game and say, we're not gonna use our resources. We're not gonna use our technologies. We're not gonna use our innovation. No, we have to start figuring out how can we provide and produce and innovate you know, our way out of this climate change crisis, so. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, we only have about 10 minutes left. Uh, so I would like to cover as, more topics as possible. So we're gonna follow a new strategy right now. So I'm gonna have four more questions. I'm gonna pose a question to each of you based on your interests or your passion uh, in research or in, in, in academia in general. Um, I'll start with this question with uh, Paul. Paul, we wanna talk about COVID and hardening borders. Um, while restrictions have been imposed globally, will there be a surge in travel or migration as restrictions go away? And what's Canada's position in your opinion on migration in the post-restriction area? Give me a loaded question. Um, <laughs> off the top of my head, right? Um, is there going to be movement across borders post-COVID? Yes, of course there is. So we've already, we've seen, we've, we've started to see it. Uh, we're gonna see more of it. Um, I live in a border town. As soon as the restrictions came off, uh, many Americans were lined up at the Windsor Tunnel to get over here because they haven't been over here um, 
for over a year looking on the various properties they've had and the various uh, boats and other things that have been in dry dock. And so we saw a surge of people and not to mention family uh, reconciliations at the border. Uh, we, there was a, uh, and continues to be a steady stream of people coming over from Michigan and other parts of the US and into Canada. Um, are, are we going to see people moving across borders permanently? I, I think so. Um, it, particularly, you know, uh, I think we'll see increased immigration from countries um, that have suffered more from COVID into those that have uh, dealt with the crisis in terms of providing vaccines. And I think the whole idea of, you know, we see this vaccine warfare is going to continue because there are other strains that are coming. And, um, and I think that is going to cause migration as well as, you know, the climate change that is going to be associated with in rising sea levels. Um, we're going to see uh, large scale migrations in, in the future. And that's something Canada is gonna to have to deal with as a country that has welcomed more uh, immigrants than many others. Um, and one that we see, you know, if you look at, as looking at numbers earlier today on uh, uh, immigration and favorability, and uh, you know, this one of the things that the political parties agree on is, is increased immigration. A little bit uh, on some in the conservatives who want to maintain, but most, uh, most of the, you know, the liberals and the NDP in particular want to increase uh, immigration levels. And they think we, we need to do that um, in order to, to grow the Canadian economy. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. I'll move on to Jane. Jane, do you think that Canada can dedicate more attention to foreign policy, or do you think we're at the level we ought to be? And now that we are approaching a federal election, what should Canada prioritize in foreign policy? Another easy question. <laughs> um, <laughs> do I think we're at the level we should be? Well, it's kind of building on the theme we've we've um, been tracking on and off in the discussion, um, not in terms of resources. Canada is not a poor country. This builds on Heather's point about, you know, our uh, capacity from an energy perspective. But even beyond that, we're a member of the G7. We are, um, you know, a solid economic performer overall. When you think of the world, um, the globe as a whole, uh, um, it's a question of how we prioritize the resources we have. And, you know, I'd just be repeating some of the things we've said before. Um, we have not been putting our resources fully into the kinds of foreign policy commitments um, we've been articulating, and, and we should be. Um, so, and I would just on that point say, it's not just about economics. Canada has tremendous resources, or, or energy, or whatever form we want to use. Canada has tremendous resources diplomatically. We still do, even though we haven't fully exercised them the way um, we may have done in the past, we still do, and we have the capacity to build on that. And so I just wanted to say, it's not just resources in that traditional sort of financial, maybe military, um, it's beyond that. Um, and we have a lot to draw on. It's a question of whether we want to do it. What would the priorities be? I, I mean, I think we've been articulating them um, in different ways. Um, climate, you know, different kinds of security issues. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to repeat those. I will just make one last point that relates to something that Bob um, said, which is which institutions. And I agree that that really matters in this context. And I would say one of the things we need to decide um, is exactly that, because why do we turn to institutions all the time? It's because of where we are in terms of the hierarchy. Institutions give us um, a solid position, established position, a formal platform from which we can make further um, moves. Um, and so which ones matters a great deal in a changing international context. Perfect. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Bob, I'll ask you the, ne the next question. Canada is not as strong as the U.S. economically or financially and cannot pretend to replace the U.S. That's one of the questions from the audience. In addition, convincing uh, domestic audiences that more money should be spent on foreign priorities is tricky. So what role do you see for Canada as a mid-level player going forward? This is like Hattie's... Uh, excruciating round where you're just going <laughs> to ask really hard questions. Um, so first I would say we are not the U.S. We shouldn't 
even think of ourselves on the same plane as the US and try to emulate uh, great powers, I think is, is highly problematic uh, because it comes with costs that frankly, we, we don't want to absorb that are not going to directly lead to uh, national interests, um, meeting national interests for us. In terms of, um, there was a, it was a complicated question, Hadi. There was a few pieces to it. Um, Do you want me to pull it, pull it again? Oh, the, the domestic audience piece. So like one of the challenges that we have is that first of all, foreign policy absolutely is a domestic issue. And I think we've been playing to domestic audiences for a while. I think part of the challenge is that we haven't done a terribly good job of articulating a value proposition to Canadians about why spending on foreign policy actually directly relates to Canadians' everyday lives. And it does. I think we actually had a prime example of this with the uh, negotiation of NAFTA 2.0 where all of a sudden people were confronted with the possibility of goods and services increasing in cost and directly affecting household budgets. That's a really great example as to how foreign policy affects everyday Canadians. More of that I think is very important in being able to articulate that value proposition, particularly when we actually have a set of uh, national interests articulated uh, to Canadians. But in terms of options that are available to mid-level powers or middle powers, the world is our oyster. It just depends on what we want to pursue and where we want to uh, focus our resources and our capabilities on being able to pursue in both the short term and long term. And that's part of why strategically it's so important for us to get our heads around these pieces. It isn't just an immediate gratification question. It's very much a setup for Canada's long term interests in determining where we are going to scale up the spending on certain things and resources being put into certain things where we can start scaling down in things that may not be as relevant to Canada over the next 10 years. So there's no shortage of opportunities for us. It depends on what role we want to play and which interests we want to pursue uh, moving forward. So. Well, thank you, Bob. And I'm glad you were able to answer the difficult question so easily. <laughs> well, the last question, I know we're almost uh, at uh, 6.30, but I'm just going to ask one last question to Heather. Um, Heather, where do you find Canada on the equity and social justice side generally? We know that there are many issues of equity, social justice, and you know white supremacy and others that we are faced with in Canada, as according to our prime minister as well, uh, like murdered and missing indigenous women, Islamophobia, racism, homophobia, and many other isms and phobias. Um, the death of George Floyd has sparked light to many already existing issues uh, that are long due, not only in the United States, but in Canada and across the globe. And, they are long due to be recognized. Where do you find Canada and its actions, policies, and efforts to address these issues? I think it's probably more of, of domestic issues. I, I, think, I think because we're so saturated with American news and North American news, I don't think we have a good perspective of how other people in the globe think of these social justice issues or think about racism or think about Indigenous nations. I think they have very different perspectives than we do in North America that we often take for granted that we all think the same. And so I think these are these are probably more important domestically. Um, I don't think other countries wanna be told by Canada, you know, how they can improve their social justice. I don't think we have the moral leadership to be able to do so. Maybe if, if we had acted differently or, or been different, you know, we don't have a, we, you know, we like to think that, and I think we all know that now, we don't have the moral high ground based on our indigenous history to go around and tell other people how they should be acting better. So that's my perspective, frankly, is that um, Canadian issues are not global issues and most countries in the world don't wanna hear from Canada how they could act better on, on these social justice issues. Perfect, and that's a wrap. Uh, thank you all very much for your, uh, for your comments and for being here. Uh, I want to thank everybody who made this uh, panel possible. Uh, it's honestly great to see such an impressive turnout and uh, engagement. Uh, sincere appreciations to our speakers, Bob, Heather, Jane, and Paul, uh, and even Dr. Carmen for such an insightful, engaging, and thought-triggering discussion, uh, which reflects the level of knowledge and expertise each of you possesses in the field. Um, thank you to our partners as well for this continue, for their continuous support, including the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, uh, the Canadian Foreign Policy Journal, and of course, the Paul Grave Macmillan series that you know, we reflected over today. Uh, I would like to particularly thank the series editors, uh, Dr. Sammy, Dr. Legacy, and Dr. Carment, for creating such an incredible resource for students in international affairs 
and foreign policy and also for those who are interested in it or passionate about it and uh, as well for uh, to Robert and Paul to Bob and Paul for uh, for the Paul Grave Handbook on International Affairs. Congratulations on that accomplishment. And uh, last but not least, I want to thank all the folks who joined us today. <laughs> there you go. You can you can buy that book, uh, or you can access it for free as well uh, online. Um, and last but not least, I want to thank all the folks who joined today. Uh, those uh, who listened actively, asked questions, uh, challenged themselves, shared comments offered something to reflect on and or learn something new. Your participation and engagement and passion, even your interest uh, are the backbone to our success and exposure and flourishing. We look forward to having you in future events. So I'm gonna wish you all a wonderful evening. Enjoy the remainder of the day with some sun and uh, stay in touch and we will see you very soon. Take care everyone.